Simply amazing U.S. artist, sculptor of international reputation, TED Talker Janet Eckelman was once rejected by seven art schools. It's a blessing. Rejection did not deter her from pursuing her art dreams. Today, Eckelman creates mind-blowing art installations that defy gravity, surprise, and inspire, and make you wonder, how the heck did she do that? <laughs> it is clear Eckelman knew in her soul all good art retains an element of surprise. It is my pleasure to welcome Janet Eckelman and her biggest and sparkiest project ever to Vancouver. Thank you. I should say welcome back because you were here uh, in Richmond during the Olympics, mm -hmm, creating a little water thing. Uh, creating a permanent work for a legacy project of the Olympics called Water Sky Garden, which people continue to enjoy, mm -hmm. I hope. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, when you were a little girl, mm -hmm. did you think out of the box? Did you blow through boundaries? Well, I didn't color in the lines. <laughs> <laughs> no one thought that was a good thing then. Um, I, you know, it's not like someone said, oh, she's a talent. Mm -hmm. um, it's more that I just knew what I wanted to do at each, I, I can't even answer. <laughs> no, you, found, you found the artist in you, you found the artist in you early and became a painter in my 20s mm -hmm. and that was really because there was nothing else I wanted to do it, it's not that anyone <laughs> said I was especially talented it's that I just wanted to live the life of an artist and I thought that meant being a painter mm -hmm. a little bohemian perhaps I went off and lived in Bali Indonesia on my own in a little house on the rice fields with a grass roof and painted and after that Oh my goodness, I went to India to teach painting because I was a painter. I shipped all my paints and supplies and special brushes and I had promised the U.S. Embassy I would give a series of exhibitions that they booked around the country and I waited for my paints to arrive and waited and waited mm -hmm. <laughs> and they never, never arrived. So, and, so alas, alack, this is almost synchronistic. It's, it's mm -hmm. kismet. Mm -hmm. It was meant to be. So your paints don't arrive. You're in India. Are you a, a Fulbright scholar at this yes, point? Yes, yes. So you have a little money. A little bit. <laughs> and a lot of demand to create something. Yes. Well, I just, it, it wasn't fun. I was, you know, really under immense pressure and just, you know, beside myself not knowing what to do. And I just had to figure something out and I was walking on the beach and watch, it was the end of the day when the fishermen are sort of bundling up their nets into mounds on the sand. And I looked at that and I thought, well, there's another approach to making a form. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have much money for buying supplies. I was trying to learn to cast bronze, but I didn't have enough bronze to make something. And I didn't have a shipping budget. And I thought, well, look at those nets. You can fold them up. They can get big. They're light. And um, that's how I started. I just started working with those fishermen. With hand-knotted nets? Yes. And I was sleeping under mosquito nets at night. So right. we took that down. And uh, I went to the tailors in town. It, it had this little village had one main street which was parallel to the beach you know and right. so the tailors started sewing up my mosquito net and then the fishermen were knotting these fish nets according to my little diagrams and they put them together and incidentally tailors are all Muslim in the village and all the fishermen were Hindu so I had the the you know all the Hindus and the Muslims were all working mm -hmm. together creating this art you so see, art does bring people together doesn't it in surprising mm -hmm. ways but in your soul, you knew you were going somewhere. The idea was audacious, obviously. Hmm. Practically, how did you do it? I'm not sure if it was audacious. <laughs> um, I just started making these forms. That at first, they were smaller, and we lifted them up on poles on the beach to photograph them mm -hmm. on, a, on a wire, you know, very low tech. And I discovered that the wind like filled them with life. They were billowing and mirroring all these patterns of air currents and it was so beautiful. I was completely mesmerized. How did you learn to trust your idea? Hmm. To go into hmm. your soul and say, this is meant to be and I am going to do it hmm. and if people laugh about it, so what? Hmm. Well, that is a good, I mean, that, that is a question kind of mm. at the core of it, because no one 
ever saw great talent, um, you know. <laughs> Seven I, arts connected. <laughs> I wasn't very good at drawing. Um, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, she should be an artist. It's more that I just wanted to live the life of an artist. Right. I was studying uh, Matisse and reading about his life and the fact that when he was an old man in his um, later life, he was confined to bed and he invented a whole new form of artwork in bed. And I really? thought, that's how I want to live. Of course. <laughs> and have the, 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 when I'm asleep at night, have the money coming through the mail. <laughs> well, there you Why go. Why <laughs> not? But your first, if yep. I'm correct, uh -huh. uh, uh, sculpture, mm -hmm. ephemeral sculpture, mm -hmm. was called Wide Hips. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I consider it a self-portrait. <laughs> uh, that's how... Uh, that's part of the content. My work mm -hmm. is very much about my own personal experience. And, you know, these billowing forms are like thinking of what it felt like to be a toddler, uh, remembering, you know, the safety of holding my mom's legs with her skirt billowing and the sense of freedom. So they come from a, an emotional place about being protected yet free and connected to the sky. I don't want to be penned in. I want to be in spaciousness. Mm. And you also make our city spacious as you bring mm. uh, your floating form, and I know they're not all floating forms, but many are, made of, of very strong threads. Yes, um, some of these threads are 15 times stronger than steel. Really? And that it's Honeywell Spectra, and that's what enables it to be so light. If I had to make them out of steel, they would be so heavy that the whole enterprise wouldn't be what it is. It's all about feeling light and airy. Mm -hmm. And so these advances in material science and technology make my work possible. But I'm assuming you're no aeronautical engineer. Nope. <laughs> you didn't take architecture. Correct. So it's puzzling. Mm -hmm. How you figured out how to put it together? I or just, did you have help? A lot of help. I think my only mm -hmm. skill is how to, um, how to ask for help. Well, all public art, I think all public art, is a team sport. Yes. And it, yours has such a cool conceptual edge and it's all there. Mm -hmm. But to get it up in the air with Junior Birdsman, mm -hmm. somebody has to help you, like a crane. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the Vancouver installation, which will be a huge surprise. An immense, fabulous team from Vancouver has been working night after night installing this work. I've been working with engineers from Vancouver. The um, Glotman Simpson firm that did the convention center right. has engineered ways that my art literally taps into the structure of the buildings. And it suspends in the air. I worked with the brilliant engineers from Arup who, who analyzed the wind. A new software tool had to be created for me to make this piece. The Autodesk company that makes design tools created right. a new custom tool that uses the constraints of my craft and then models gravity and wind. Well, I doubt we'll have a hurricane while you're here. We are engineered to 96 miles per hour wind. Really? Mm -hmm. and, and the permits, that must be d difficult when you work with the city fathers and mothers to get the permits because safety big factor? There were more permits than I ever imagined. We, we had to go through uh, aviation. We had the federal, uh, the port. We had the province with the convention center. With the city, we did a development permit, a building permit. We have noise ordinance. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of process. And what drives me is this desire to see it up and share it with the public. And otherwise, I just try and hold on to that to get through all these uh, hurdles along exactly. the way. Exactly. And the, the title is Skies Painted with unnumbered sparks. Sparks, and the sparks? I didn't write it, it's William Shakespeare. Uh, okay. So Shakespeare was referring to the sky, the starry oh. skies, and what's exciting for me is here the public, each person who visits, they are the spark, the star, who actually gets to paint the sky, because this work has an interactive element. So as we go under it and look up in the night, is it lit? It is illuminated, but as you come in, if you have a mobile device, right. it, if you join the network, it instantly allows you to make 
projected light painting onto the sculpture in a very interesting way. It's the work of another artist. I invited an artist I met at the TED Talks right. a few years ago, Aaron Koblen, who leads mm. Google's data arts team, to design a new work to enhance this social potential. Well, there is social potential to all public art, I think. Uh, yeah. We had uh, Oppenheim here who did the mm -hmm. uh, device to root out evil and it was an upside down <laughs> church with the steeple in the ground, caused a huge stir in the city. People wow. were saying, that's sacrilegious. You know, right? not really getting the contemporary part of it or the meaning of what he meant and all mm. of that. Have you disturbed people around the world with your works that you know of? Well. Um, there certainly have been uh, various protests, uh, but mostly in favor of my work. Uh, my work has been commissioned by cities, and so because it's funded by taxpayers, there's often a kind of controversy, and uh, more than 100 people showed up on the City Hall Plaza in Phoenix to, um, to make sure that the sculpture did get built, and it, it, it now is there today in the middle of their downtown. And is Phoenix where the uh, the attorney, uh, he was a lawyer, didn't uh, like art, didn't know about art, didn't care about art, trotted his staff out or people out of the building to lie underneath your sculpture? That is a true story. In the business suits? Complete business suits. Suddenly people who hadn't, you know, had art as a, you know, weren't the kinds of people who had been to the mm -hmm. art museum. Right but wanted you know, to just share in this. They just lay down and when you start watching the changing patterns of wind and you're next to people you don't know and suddenly you can start a conversation. So it's magical. I in, hope. In a way. And you know, if you have like a concrete jungle and throw some softness into it, how great. You go to Detroit, for yeah. instance. Mm -hmm. Been to Detroit uh, with a sculpture yet? Not yet. Maybe that's coming. We have been discussing it, in fact. Really? Mm -hmm. What about 9-11? Where were you? I was in New York City. I lived in New York City. Uh, that morning was uh, one of the most beautiful, bright, clear September days. And it, afterwards, every time there was a beautiful fall day, I would have this sense that something was going to happen. Mm, I sure. designed a 9-11 memorial after that. It was such a, uh, an important experience for me. Uh, did the people from Ground Zero, uh, uh, the head people in New York, call you to be part of any of the reconstruction? Uh, I'm no. just thinking it would be a wonderful thing oh. instead of the Twin Towers. To have a soft, mm -hmm. well, um, I, I did get asked to, to help design a, a memorial uh, for the Hudson River, and that was quite right. a special experience. I'm sure it was. Mm -hmm. Were you scared when you were in New York? Were you in danger when 9-11 hit, or were you far enough away to just... Uh, I was uptown. Really? We could smell it. Mm. Let's go on. Yes. That is not my favorite That's memory. Cool. No, I'm sure not. <laughs> I didn't but... answer your question about being able to trust in an idea, and I guess I didn't answer it because I don't know. It's because I just mm -hmm. don't know what it is, but I do... I think my one skill may be that I pay attention and I actually respect those little ideas or a doodle on a napkin and I actually treat them with respect because you don't know a small idea can take a big form. Very much so and in your Phoenix work you title it Her Secret is Patience. Mm. How do you come up with the titles? Well that title um, is from Emerson, okay. and the full quote from Emerson is, adopt the pace of nature, her mm -hmm. secret is patience. Mm -hmm. And I think it actually speaks to my whole art practice. I'm just patiently plotting away, moment by moment, figuring out the next question. Well, Picasso, and I think it's one of your favorite quotes, uh, when inspiration finds me, she, she will, will find, find me, me at work. work. Okay, we'll come back and talk more with <laughs> Janet Eckelman.